Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, send forth your Holy Spirit upon us this night. Open our minds and hearts to your grace, to your word, to your truth. Help us to grow in our knowledge of you as we walk with your Son, as you fashion us to be more like him. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, this week is acedia, indifference to the gift. So we'll explain that word. That's a Greek word, often translated as sloth. So we will describe more acedia. I think often sloth has a very limited understanding of laziness. But there's actually something a lot more, or less, I suppose, <laughs> to acedia. Um, just a recap of where we've been. So remember, it's God who has created all things. He's created us. He's revealed himself to us so that we may enjoy his life. The communion of persons that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share. And they draw us into their, their life, their inner life. So there's that conversion process. And then there's that growing in our dialogue with him through prayer. The heart-to-heart And we've also been given Christ, beholding his glory. That was our separate talk. Christ is, of course, always the center for us. And then we looked at the gifts that God has given, his virtues, faith, hope, and love, as we saw. That light to be able to see the hope that pulls us forward, that moves us forward. And I mentioned it in today's homily, which was um, on presumptuous, well, the gospel was a presumptuous question that one man, a person in the crowd, asked Jesus. Like, so only a few of us are going to be saved, right? Kind of that was his tone. And there's this presumptuous attitude. The opposite is despair. And we saw either one of those is a, def- uh, a defect of hope. And so hope really is that gift we've been given. God is truly present now, and he draws me along. And then, of course, love. Love is the thing that we, we are drawn by the good, and we give ourselves over. And then the uh, cardinal virtues that we saw do a quiz again, see if anyone can remember all four. Anyone? Prudence, justice, temperance, and Yeah, good. Now explain them. No, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prudence, remember the stepping stones to know the, the means in order to, the, the, to get to the end that we seek, the good end. Then there's the justice of really we're, we're always in community. It's always not just my good. My good is always kind of in this Harmony wants to dance, like with, with everyone, right? And obviously the immediate people. And I gave this simple example of it's an act of justice to remain quiet while others are trying to listen. I mean, that's a very basic example. We don't normally think that as being just, but it is. And then fortitude, that strength to pursue the difficult good. When the, heart, when the going gets tough, well, keep going cheerfully. And then temperance is not just the restraint, but... We say no sometimes, we need that at the beginning in order for the yes to be correctly, to desire correctly. And so those are the gifts we've been given. And finally now we come to um, acedia, which is, there are many vices. We could list the capital vices, and acedia is actually one of them, often, again, listed as sloth. I wanted to focus on this because it seems to be, well, not well known, but very prevalent, actually. Or the temptation at least is there, but I think many people can fall into it in different ways. Especially because it's particular to, first preventing on the journey, but especially those who have already been on the journey, to kind of stop. And I'll pause for a moment. Is that TV bothering people? Okay. Like like I'm visual, so I'm like, ah, stop. So. Acedia, indifference to the gift. I put it that way because we've been, well, a class I taught, I really emphasized the gift aspect of creation, and that's been implied in a lot of what we've talked about. God shares himself. He gives himself. He gives gifts to us. And so when there's this indifference to a gift, I mean, imagine if someone on your birthday brings you a gift and you're just like, hmm. <laughs> the giver is going to be a little bit like, really? <laughs> I put a lot into that. So when we're indifferent, it's really, it's, it hurts us. In some way, it hurts God, right? It hurts the giver. So let's start to look at what 
this is. The spiritual, one of the spiritual conditions of our age, I, we could say others, that image alone kind of conjures up this like monotony. She's kind of walking along into who knows what, an abyss, desert. You're going to see many desert images tonight. Kind of one way we can look at our age in general is boredom from an insatiable desire to be free. We talk about this great desire that we have within, the desire for the good. There's kind of this elevation of what it, freedom. I want to be free. And now, we, we are called to be free. But a limited understanding of free or distorted understanding of what that means is free from restraint, free to do whatever I want, free at all times, free... But then we actually started more and more. It's insatiable because, well, we can't actually achieve that. How are you supposed to be free from all restraint? Well, gravity's holding me down until I can get rid of that. And then it'll be something else. The body, everything, it's just all over. Like freedom. I just want to be free without knowing what that means. And it can lead to this intense boredom. When I just talk to them like I'm bored. But I mean, if anyone's talked to like a 10-year-old, why don't you go outside and play? I'm bored. You want to do this? No, I don't want to do that. I'm bored. My nephew, for example, he's, like, he's sitting on the couch. He's like slumping there. Like, why are you bored? Because I just want to go on the screens. You know, they have like their limited screen time because otherwise they'd be there all day. Like, oh, game, game, game. So he sits there and doesn't do anything. So of course he's a child, but still it's kind of a good image of this. There's so many goods around and there's perhaps this focus on, but I just want this and I can't get it. So therefore, I'm going to be bored. Freedom has also become this idol, which also is unhooked from reality. So uh, sometimes you'll see quotes here. Um, I took out the citations on each of these slides. The books will be at the end, some sources, so I'll show you those at the end. But freedom has become an idol, as I just described. It's kind of freedom for freedom's sake. Our lives, then, are arbitrary and insignificant, an instance bearing no weight. So there's a book that was talking a lot about the weight of being, being the things that exist. Everything, you, things around us, they have substance. Gravitas. Like, they mean something. Like, there. But if we're not grounded and rooted, if our freedom's not grounded and rooted in reality, in true goods, in the good of a real person in front of me, my freedom to be able to respond and to give, our lives start to become arbitrary. And this weightlessness can result... We're going we're gonna to describe some of like why this is happening, but this is kind of an overall of, a view of kind of what the... If we took a pulse of our, spirit, our age, these are some of the things that would be prevalent. This weightlessness, in other words, free me from all restraint, results in the torpor of meaninglessness, the spiritually innervating... Results of a life not worth living. So it's funny that the, the very desire to be absolutely free, eventually what it leads to is meaninglessness. Which is very strange because you, the main reason is, is because I just described. Freedom has to be rooted in reality. Freedom has to be rooted in responding to the real good. As we talked about virtue, remember it was the virtuoso is free to play the piano. They're not I mean, free to bang on it or break it if they want, but you're like, why'd you just do that? Like, well, I'm being free. No, that was being reckless. Why did you do that? Freedom is the ability to play that music. And if it's left unchecked, it's transforming itself into boredom, nihilism, a disgust, even a disgust, a disgust at oneself. Now, I'm not analyzing every single person's problem in the world, but I would, I would wager a guess that many people that arrive at a, sim a disgust for their, themselves, a disgust at their bodies, a disgust at their gender, a disgust at their loved ones, a disgust at just life in general, there's something of a seed at present. Now, there could be lots of causes why someone went down that path, so that's, that's a different story. You really need to know someone's story, right? But if we're just going to pinpoint, hey... This might be one thing to look at. So let's start looking at it. So we have the paradox of the desert. We're going to unfold this because it's precisely in the desert that, we, that Assyria attacks. But it's also precisely in the desert 
that will find true freedom. So that's why I have this paradox here. So the historical reasons for putting the desert and how this, this connection to Assyria and monks or hermits was actually the Anchorites in the 4th century after Christianity had an official imperial status in the Roman Empire, which included northern Africa and the Middle East. There were some who, after the martyrdom period kind of ended, there would still be martyrs, but the mass martyrdom kind of ended, and there were some who really wanted this deeper spirituality, kind of the daily martyrdom of living. So some moved, actually moved out to the desert, and there was a group called the Anchorites, and you have also St. Anthony of the Desert and different ones who actually moved out to the desert. And the main idea was really imitating Christ who went to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, faced temptation to divert, who was trying to divert him from his God-given identity. And so there were some people that felt this call. And so they're in the desert, literally. But a place, the desert is an interesting place. I've actually never been, like, in the desert. I've been to a kind of really rugged terrain, but has anyone here actually been in, like, a desert in the middle where you don't see anything but desert? Yeah, you have? Yeah, so I'm guessing it's, it's, like, I was in the middle of the ocean once where all you see is ocean, so it's probably a similar experience where you just look around. Oh, my gosh. And there's a place of disorientation. So when we're in the desert, like, this guy with the map is like, what, what good is that going to do you? Oh, it's that sand pile over there, I think. And then you have sense of fear could be an, I mean, literally if you're out there alone fear like i don't know where i'm at you can have mirages that are out there you really have the heat coming off the sand and you're you're just yearning for water and then there's also something that just seems to be like a destination point and it's not it just keeps moving beyond where you're at and there can be this sense of emptiness on the spiritual level, too, like if we're actually in literally the desert, like the, these, these hermits, but think about being in that place, trying to devote your life to God, having no bearings within, we're losing a sense of orientation. We can start to feel fear and unsettling. Things start to lose their meaning. We don't have perspective. So if anyone's ever been in that place, it's a place of dryness. When we're in dryness, things start to lose their meaning. Not in themselves, but at least for us. Like, we don't really understand them. So because of that, we're going to have a response many times, and we'll talk more about this when we get into, we'll see these themes again of wanting to run. The Dark Knight is the last theme, but it comes out again when we look at discernment and um, desolation. So we're going to see this again, but in the context of Assyria, in this context, we're starting to feel disoriented, empty, and you're going to want, some people are going to want to flee. We'll get to this in a moment. But it becomes a place of endurance. And so this is already linking us to prayer. There simply is no alternative but to remain in the desert places. Again, this paradox. The paradox, the next slide, we're going to see that it's a place of attack, but it's also a place of endurance. There's simply no alternative but to remain in the desert places when we are led there including waiting out the long spells when we are doing nothing but wandering around in the wilderness of our own prayers. So if you've ever been in the wilderness of your own prayers, like, I don't even know what I'm praying for. Like, ugh. Well, it's saying right here, there's simply no alternative but to stay. Wait. Stay. Endure. There's no easy way out. It always feels as though we are wasting time in the wilderness, that we are heading nowhere, we'll never be able to leave, but it is there we must stay. So that's the principle. When we start to feel, we just kind of did an overview real of the spiritual age, the consequences when we don't stay, when we're kind of unbridled freedom, just looking for it. I want to get out of the desert. I want to get out of this place. We have to stay in the desert. So what's happening there? It's not just this, okay, I'm, I'm having a hard time. It's dry. I'm just That's also naturally true. Like, if we're doing one thing for a very long time or not much is happening, psychologically, it's also hard. But we do have a spiritual enemy. And it's also a place of attack. When we're vulnerable, especially when we're down, 
I mean, if anyone in here was really down, maybe someone is, and I knew it, I'm going to come up to you, and I'm going to just going to start really laying it on. All of the faults, if I knew them, every single fault that you have, <laughs> you're so susceptible to them being torn down more. Of course, I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> but that's only the evil one. That's what he's looking for constantly. Oh, you're down? Okay. Oh, you want to get out of this place? Yeah. The noonday demon, the Cedia, attacks. Now, we're going to look at why this is personified. So there really is this, an evil spirit, but there's also the vice itself in our disordered passions and all those things. So we're specifically naming this one Acedia. So why is it called the noonday demon? So Psalm 91, or Psalm 90 if it's the Vulgate, and the reason is because the numbering's different in the Psalms based on the translation, they're divided differently, so anyway, that's why they have two numbers there. Hebrew, from this psalm is from destruction that despoils at midday. Well, it's the translation, literal translation. The Vulgate, demonium, demon, demonium, sorry, meridianum, the, new, the devil of noon. So it translates that phrase, from the destruction that despoils at midday. Well, it says, from the devil, from the demon of midday that destroys us. And so destruction then becomes personified in the St. Jerome's translation of the Vulgate, of the, the Hebrew and so that's where the, the monks kind of start to, to meditate. On midday, they start to have this experience of, well, simply, well, before I show the next, with, with their experiences, they're there praying, and the day gets long, and as the sun goes up, and there are lots of quotes of this, um, what the monk starts to experience is looking out the window, maybe someone will come. I wonder what the sun is doing now. I don't want to be over here praying or working the soil. It, so it's just this kind of floating around. What we saw in the very first slide, the spiritual age and the woman walking through the desert, it's kind of like that, the wandering. I don't want to be seated here. Is someone coming? And it doesn't sound like that's a bored state, or, but, it's, but it actually is. It's actually this, I don't want to be here. And so the word itself for Greek, the Greek word acedia, acadia, it literally means a, which is a negative, kados, which means care. I don't care. <laughs> That's what acedia means. I don't care, without care. That's like the hardest thing to, it's hard, it's so hard to engage typical teenage response, you know, when I do, I don't care. Like, how can you engage with that? You can't. I don't want to, what do you want? I don't care. You don't care? No, I don't care. Well, if that's how our, our attitude is, we're like, God is like tapping us. Hey, I want to tell you something. I don't care. Now, we might not say it that way, but it's kind of this, the monk in his cell wanting to, I want to do, I should be doing this. I don't care. I want to do something else. I don't want to be in the moment. So it's lacking care, lacking passion, lacking attentiveness. I mean, just that picture, like this boredom. So sloth, like I said, is the um, common translation. And there's a history of how that got translated, so which we won't go into. But um, there, there's no real equivalent word in Latin and then in English that literally translates acedia. We don't have that word. I mean, we say, care, uh, it's not even careless. It's like I just described. It's, it's this lethargy of existence of the present moment and so sloth eventually became, I think it was Gregory the Great, in the list, he, he listed acedia, the translation became sloth. St. Thomas Aquinas, though, he describes this, and it's very close to what we're seeing with acedia. It's, it's not just laziness, like I was slothful, meaning I, does that mean I can be lazy? But it kind of gets deeper to, well, why were you lazy? It's just, and it gets worse, like it's something deeper. A specific sadness about God of having to give something up for God. So I think a good image here, and depicted in the icon, is the young rich man who comes, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And he lists the, you know, numbers four through ten. And he leaves, he leaves out the first three, which is kind of like, you're looking for God, so. Well, I've done all those things from my youth. Well, you're lacking one thing. Go, sell all you have, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. And he goes away sad because he had many possessions. That's what it says. He went away sad 
because he had many possessions. The man who came seeking eternal life, the path, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he goes away sad. He's sad about God. He's sad about having to give something up for him. He's sad about having to lose something. So that's, that's really, at the, at the core, I mean, there could be pride there too, but it's a real slothful attitude. It can go deeper to a disgust with activity. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, I, I just don't, I don't want to be bothered with that. I mean, we've all had that. It's like, I don't want to do that. Now, it's not, one thing is like, oh, I really don't feel like exercising or whatever. It's like, I'll go do it. But kind of if it gets deeper and deeper, it's like there's more and more disgust, which is a real strong word. It's like, oh, I, don't, I don't like that. We shouldn't. The spiritual good actually starts to seem to be evil. It's invading on me. Like this young rich man, the very one, the good one, right in front of him. He starts to see it as, he wouldn't say, well, you're evil, but he walks away. He's sad because he sees his goods and, well, you're evil. You're going to take that away from me. And then the last one, in a second, is it's against the, the joy of love. Like, love really does bring joy. One of the fruits of charity is, uh, the Holy Spirit, sorry, is joy and love. But it really becomes this fault against the joy of loving, the joy of being in the moment, the joy of creation, all the things we've talked about before, especially the first chapter. So that's acedia, also known as sloth. Yes. So if a person were to be in, let's say, in that particular, with that particular response, what would it reveal about their spiritual journey? Would it be that they're not prepared, they haven't, they're, they're, they're entering, and maybe the virtues are showing up or are being worked on? Like from what perspective can that be looked at? Yeah. Yeah, well, it depends on the person, yeah. Um, so for the recording, the question is, well, how do we know, if a person's responding this way, how do we know what the causes are? I guess that would be a, a summary wave. I'd be like, not how do you know what the causes are, but what, what is it indicative of? Is it indicative of that they're not really prepared? Yeah, that they're not really prepared? Yeah. That yeah. is working on them, that, you know? Yeah. So the, the context, again, is the monk who's devoted his life to God or the hermit, he's really committed. He goes out into a desert, literally. And this happens later in months. They're in their cell. So it was kind of, I'm in the cell. I know my schedule, and their schedule's very regimented. And it's not wanting to be there. It's not, so they're actually committed to following him. They're, they're following the Lord. But they get to a point where there's a desert, there's a dryness, there's a sense of disorientation. There's a, I, ah, I want some excitement. And this can happen in subtle ways, too, when people are in prayer and it's, it's drying up. Maybe God himself is actually taking away some of the initial excitement we felt sometimes. And without, no, we didn't really, we were seeking God, but we were also kind of seeking the pleasure that, that gave. Like, oh, this is nice. And then if that goes away, then we start to get, like, wait, some, did I, am I doing something wrong? Why isn't he here? And God's saying, well, I am here. You're just not feeling it. No, but I want to feel it. No, but do you want me or do you want the feeling? Well, I want both. Okay, but I want to make sure you want me. Like, that would be with any person. Like, do you love me or the feeling I give you? Well, I love both. Well, do you really love me? That could happen with all sorts of people. You get this. I remember hearing this, like this beautiful, like, supermodel. And she wondered, I wonder if people love me or do they love my pretty face? So you think, well, of course people love you. It's like, would, what if I was ugly? Would you love me? No, I don't think any person's ugly. But you know what I mean. It's not like this. That's a question that people have. So there, with God, too, is like, well, do you love me? And when these things start to disappear, like the consolations, and we'll see that, again, more discernment will help answer this question more in detail. Um, yeah, we could start to say, well, well, what is it in me? What am I following? What's going on in me? Am I doing something that's drying up, making me feel dry? So here we're seeing, though, is this a little bit of a, a spirit that's attacking a vice that can set in where if we give in to it, well, I just want to escape. I want to escape the moment. I want to get out of the desert. I don't want to be here. It starts to leave us just wandering. And then I'll eventually get to actual disgust. 
even turning away. I don't want God. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about now down the path, right? It's not going to be like day one and then day two you hate God. But it's this, this journey, or negative journey. So the things to look for, so if anything I've said is kind of said, oh yeah, I've kind of felt that before. It's not to like scare people. I mean, if it's scary, that's good, but let it lead you back to God. But it's just to kind of take note that there, there really is this, this spirit and a vice that can want, it wants to attack us, that wants to say that the mundane is not worth being in. The desert's not worth it. The dryness doesn't mean anything. That's what Asidia is saying. But what faith is saying is like, it does mean something. So Asidia is kind of just that fault against that. But what happens is, you go from monotony to futility to despairing indifference. Asidia drives the monk to leave his cell and to flee intimacy with God so as to seek here and there some compensation for the austere way of life to which he felt called by God. So it's just repeating in a phrase kind of what's happening. So you have... You know, someone could look at a monk and say, wow, what a life, or a nun. It's like, wow, a whole life dedicated to God. And you have this painting here of like, what did I do? <laughs> like, I just don't want to be here. This is so boring. When will the day end? When will the next feast day be here? You know? <laughs> I remember when I was a novice, like, you kind of have that. You're just like, the schedule uh, again. In, I was in Canada too, so it's snowing and snowing and snowing and snowing and snowing by March, like enough. And I'm from Florida, so I like the I like the first snow and the second and the fourth and the eighth. But like after four months, you're just kind of like, ah, can we go somewhere sunny? So that's kind of that's kind of what it is. Like, and it, there's actually a lot of growth. So I'll give a, per- a personal story to kind of illustrate this. I remember, like, my novitiate, there were parts that were really hard, like internally, and I think a lot of it was this. Because you're in the, get up at this time, you do this, you have prayers together, you go to the next thing, the next thing together, the next thing. And every day is the same. And there's nothing objectively wrong. You say, well, that'd be great to have a schedule. And some people, like, really love that. I kind of like a schedule, but you really have to face up to yourself. Like, there's nowhere to go. And if you can, you can just, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to reflect. I'm not going to be here. That would be acedia. And I'm sure I fell into that many times. But the staying, staying put. Like, I definitely felt that desire. Like, I want to be out of here. I want to do this. I want to go somewhere else. Can I go st- stay? Now, there are times where we do have to leave a situation, right? So discernment comes in with that. Prudence helps us. But we're talking about that. Just, uh, I want to get out of here. So I'll get out. I don't like feeling this. I don't like feeling nothing. But what happens is we start to become more and more indifferent because we're not paying attention to the actual gift of the moment. Like, the only thing given is now, right now. Whatever God is saying to you right now, whatever, all these people here, right now, this is the given. You're here. Like, that's the, you're not somewhere else. You could be somewhere else, but you're here. So that's, that's kind of the point. It seems so obvious, but many times, yeah, we kind of like, oh, if only, oh, I wish I were. I wonder what it would be like. No, it's not bad to think of things like that, but it's, if it's always an escape, no, stay here. Do the hard work of staying. So let's look at a summary. And we have, um, it's a little bit of a shorter lecture tonight, so I want to go through the summary, a few summary statements. And then we have just a, a Bible verse as well to kind of look through together. That con- It's kind of the remedies against which are important. So the summary for Asidi, it's the lack of care, listlessness, listlessness, Torpor, disconnectedness, a wandering heart, an unwillingness to accept this present moment and place as a gift, which could lead to disgust with goodness of things and its power over me. So think about, like, I don't want this thing to affect me. It could lead to that as well. No, I don't want to be touched by the moment. We start to become hardened and defensive. And there's, we talk about eros and agape when we talked about love. Remember, eros was the being drawn by the good. I see a good, it draws me. That's eros in very general terms. So we don't have this open to, no openness to the good. It's like cutting eros, the movement that we have, this gift we've been given. And there's no true agape, the giving of oneself to the good that I see, especially when we're talking about persons, people. 
We don't surrender to the good. We don't surrender to the gift. We don't, we don't really engage as we we're called to. When God says love, the CD is really like, so, no, we're not going to do that. So that's why I'm just really highlighting it because there are many other things that I think can attach to this because we can have pride and that can kind of harden us. It's like, no, I don't want to do this. So there's going to be a relation to it. Um, or just mere, like, I just like feeling comfortable. You know, I'm kind of attached to that. This, this is one of these, like, it's almost like this cancer that once it starts getting in, it just, it's dangerous. And that's it's so prevalent in our society. It's super subtle, but it can just lead to what we see around in so many places, and we can look at our own hearts. Yeah, it's just this, like, discontentment. I'm not connected. Just not to beat a dead horse here, but what happens is we no longer see work and effort as gifts. The gift to work, sometimes we think it's the sweat of the brow. Well, that was kind of the, the consequence of sin, like work became toil. But we're still called to work. Like Adam and Eve did work. They were called to cultivate the garden. That's work. Like there's a glory in working. They, didn't, they wouldn't have felt the toil of that before, like ugh, the drudgery. But there would have been effort so what happens is we no longer see those things as gifts. We want to flee by avoidance, running away. We can be faint-hearted, or we can fly by struggle or pushing away, which gets worse as rancor or malice. And then we can spend our times with compensation-seeking, daydreaming, useless wandering, longing for that person or that place. So we see it's what it is. Just it's because of the reality of the moment is not appealing in some way. I want to flee. And the more I just kind of live in that zone, that's the more I just, I'm detached from reality. And then I'm enslaved to that. So the very first slide where we saw that, that kind of worship of freedom, a certain notion of freedom, that's where we see it just, well, it actually leads to the very opposite of what they were seeking in the first place, which is slavery. Slavery to your wandering. No, I'm free. No, you're not. You're wandering. I can stop. Stop. I got to stay here? Yeah, that's where it's not wandering. If you're not wandering, you're staying here. <laughs> and general discouragement, heaviness of soul, hardness of heart. So does that make sense of what acedia is? I mean, there would be more to say and more quotes, but generally speaking, that's kind of the, what it is. And I'm going to look at remedies, and then we'll have an exercise. Not really an exercise. Kind of we'll look at it together with the scriptures. Uh-huh. Not, not to the point of certainly not, she wasn't lazy. <laughs> uh-huh. But I remember reading things yeah, yeah. about her, uh, the, uh, just the, dis, the discontent or, or feeling yeah. the absence of Jesus, mm-hmm. even with. So, how would you relate? I don't think this is the exact same of what you're talking about, but how would you compare that? Yeah. So I think one distinction is what I didn't say specifically, there can be temptations to this and then giving in to temptation. So a temptation is never the giving in. It's the, the temptation to want to get out. I'm sure Mother Teresa felt like, I don't want to be in this darkness. But didn't mean she escaped the darkness or wanted to flee from it. Maybe she had moments, but I think generally speaking, that was her heroism. She stayed in this intense, dark desert. Which was more extreme than I think most people. There might be some other hidden soul out there that's going through something similar. But we've been able, we've been seeing, we, I mean, we can know this, this woman, she revealed later that she went through that. So I think it's the, we can all be tempted in different ways. Certain temptations affect others and the your person next to you is like, oh, that's never tempted me. It's like, how's that never tempted you? It's like, I don't know. You know? <laughs> so, but the temptation itself is not the falling into. It's not the going away. It's not the listening to the voice. It's kind of like that, you know you want to do this. Or, hey, wouldn't that be great if? It's like, no, I'm not going there. So there are two things. Acedia can tempt, and if we fall into acedia, that's when it can start to lead to these bad fruits. Does that make sense? So acedia in itself is always going to be this it's, what it's, Acedia is always going to suggest, hey, get out of the moment. Go somewhere else. 
you can go, you don't have to be here. You can find your happiness somewhere else. That's what Asidi is going to say. And if I start giving in to that voice, that's when I start to have the vice of acedia, like it's taken root in me. And if it takes root, then that's when we start to have to the point of you could actually be disgusted with the things of God. You know, so that's where you have different, the, the temptation, the giving in, and if you keep on that path, it's going to bear more and more bad fruit. Does that make sense? So you can, I mean, Jesus himself was tempted, like, and it was a real temptation. There was something really attractive about what the devil was saying. Like, you could see Jesus. He didn't have, it's hard for us to understand because we have this concupiscence, like this little bit of extra bend towards the, yeah, the enticement of that thing you're suggesting, evil one. Jesus, though, he, there was a good that the devil presented. He said, you know, because Jesus actually did have the power to invoke legions of angels. That was a real power he had. He, I mean, he know, I, yeah, I could just say, come, and they will come. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to use my power that way. He, reje- he rejected the temptation, the misuse of power, real power that he actually possessed. So that's just, again, the distinction between temptation and falling in. So there are remedies, the five traditional remedies are tears, which means really tears for our own sins. It sounds interesting, so think about, think about how could that, why that would be a remedy. Well, it's something about, we can often feel discomfort in our desert because we're all, we're coming in face to face with ourselves. If you stop to think about it, sometimes they're like, I don't, I'm not really comfortable with thinking about this right now. Or maybe it's something you did, and you're like, ah. Tears means that you've actually looked at that thing. You've stayed there. That doesn't mean every time you're contrite, you actually have to cry. But it's a sense of, like, deep contrition. I mean, if you do cry, great. But, I mean, it's this sincere, I'm going to look face-to-face at this. I'm going to look at me face-to-face, what I've done, what I have failed to do. So tears actually becomes this, this sign of a remedy. Like, I really cry for the times I wasn't present. Like, in, in fact, then you start to be present. I don't know if that makes sense. Prayer and work. Like, actually doing the thing you don't want to do. <laughs> like, I don't want to do that prayer. I don't want to work at this. Well, do it. But it's toilsome. Do it anyway. And this isn't, this isn't like a striving for perfection and you go, okay, I'm going to do this and work harder and I'm going to get there. No, it's more I'm resisting the temptation not to work. So therefore, roll up your sleeves and it's like, okay, I'm going to do the hard work of now. Especially if you want to flee. Doing the hard work of now. The hard work of this 15 minutes of prayer that I've committed to. Doing this hard work of being here with these people, children or whatever it is. The enteretic method, so that means contradiction. So with Jesus in the desert, it's when he contradicts the devil using the word of God. So the de- and then the devil kind of caught on, oh, you use the word of God? Okay, I'll use that back at you. So he throws up, what doesn't scripture say? And then Jesus uses a rebuttal back by using the truth. So that's a way of contradict the very thing you hear. And this can happen with all temptations. This is actually a very useful tool because many times people will say, well, I felt, I felt tempted to this or I felt this thought about myself or I thought this and this and this. Just state back the truth. And sometimes it's just starting with, yeah, I really feel like I want to do that, but I won't do that because I also know that fill in the blank. You know, so you might be tempted to, um, I mean, we'll keep it real simple, but let's say, yeah, I just always go for that third glass of wine, right? It's like, no, but, but you kind of want it. Yeah, but it's, it's okay. I mean, it helps you relax. No, nah, but I said I wouldn't. No, nah, but I want it. What you have to do is, because I think when we start to half toy with temptation like that, like let's say the thing you've resolved to do is like, I'm not going to have a third glass of wine, just to use an example. And let's say you're feeling the temptation. Say it. Well, I do want the third glass of wine. Part of me does, but I'm not going to have it. Why? And you might have scripture verses handy of like what it means to be faithful to a promise or that God is present in the moment. And you say those things. Like that's the contradiction. You contradict what this thing is suggesting, but no, just do it. 
I mean, it's, what's, what, it's just a glass of wine. Or however that voice comes, right? So that's when you say, no, I hear you. I do want the glass of wine, okay? But I'm not going to have it. <laughs> Sometimes that's the, the bold response like that can be very helpful against temptation because the devil flees when we stand in faith. Like, he, he's this... And we, don't, we don't dialogue with the devil, but the devil really is a coward. I mean, he just is all like, you know, he puts his fangs out, his claws. He's certainly powerful, certainly very intelligent, but he's proud. He's just all pride. And so when you stand up against him with the power of Christ, like there really is, I mean, he might come back stronger, but usually, he kind of flees. It just kind of... I to resist the devil, solid in your faith. If you stand up against the devil, there's another passage, is that he will flee. So, antiretic method. Meditation on death can be very helpful, too. It's like, oh, I don't really like to do that. It doesn't mean do this in a morbid way, but it's actually just spend every once in a while, contemplate that. We all know we're not going to live forever. Like the, the video series I'm doing, the search um, on Sundays. So it's kind of really as an evangelization tool, like to just to people have really the basic questions. Maybe it's about religion, maybe it's about God. So the very first episode started with um, everyone in this planet is going to die. And he's like, isn't that a great way to start all this? You know, like, we're, what are you seeking? He's talking about happiness and this and that. We're all going to die. That's a sobering reality. So what does that mean? Well, I'm not going to live forever. Paul Zuccarelli on Sunday, the last Sunday, he talked about that Proverbs of, uh, I forget the verse, but he who meditates on death will not sin. Like if I can really thought, I'm going to die in an hour, when Pi and I can, the first thing is like, oh, let's go sin. Like, well, that'd be very, most likely you're not going to do that. If you were thinking of that, okay, you're, We'll pray for your conversion, right? But meditation on death helps you. It's like, what, is the, what would it be like? What would I like that experience to be like? Imagine myself on my deathbed, the last moments. Who do I want to be there? What do I want to say to God? Well, say it. <laughs> like, there's something about that moment. Death is a gift. Yeah, well, death is also a gift. Yeah, because it's... Yeah, well... Through Christ's resurrection, it yet it, the, the this life won't last forever, and through His resurrection, yeah, death becomes a gift. I, I know what you mean. Yeah, death in itself was actually the punishment. It wasn't God's original plan, but through Christ's death and then resurrection, death can be seen. It's a real gift. Scary, but still a gift. So it's helpful to look at death and then perseverance itself, just staying. So I'm going to look at the next. Phrase, there's a Greek word that means perseverance. It could be translated. So from hypomone, which literally means, I mean, steadfastness, perseverance, but it means under the yoke. That's what the word means. That's why I have the picture of the yoke there, right? So think of yourself with yoke, like you're, you're under the weight of the, the, bur the moment, right? Think of the moment as, okay, I'm under this yoke. I'm stuck to it. And I persevere. But think of yourself also with Christ, like take my yoke upon you which means you kind of have to dump your yoke and put his on you. But you're with him, but you're still under the yoke. Something about that persevering through a difficult situation or just life and like the monotony of things that can, sometimes life can be monotonous. But the more we stay, the more we discover it's not just monotonous. There's actually a lot to be discovered in each moment, even the most monotonous ones. It's a patient enduring. Instability then leads to union. So again, the, the picture of the, the yoke being there together in the moment, God is actually present in the moment. So that's why stability leads to deeper union or opens the door to that. And then union leads to joy. Um, I just made this play on words. It doesn't really mean this. But joy leads to a lightedness, be a glow with the Spirit. Romans 12, 11, which I'm sure we'll have very shortly in the daily reading since we're going through Romans. But there's this passage at the end, like St. Paul says, be a glow with the Spirit. Like when the Spirit, we're really present and we're with Him, we'll really start to become light, joyful.
and it leads to greater courage. So there's perseverance, which is key. So the other, method, the other five things I mentioned on that other slide, there's something key about, I think, about perseverance, and there's also something key about thanksgiving. I just love this picture, this little girl, like, this is the most exciting thing that's ever happened in her whole life. She's like, look at the leaves! Oh my gosh! Like, and if we saw a little child doing that, everyone would just like, look at her. There are leaves. And she's like, yeah, there are leaves, you know? <laughs> well, that's just for kids. Well, maybe we should go to Bond Park when the leaves start falling and go out there and like, just start tossing them around. It's like, people are like, what is going on with that person? There are leaves. I'm happy, okay? From Thanksgiving to Joy, and this is, a, again, a, a reference to a book I've mentioned a few times, um, Anne Voskamp, 1,000 Gifts. So she talks about Eucharisteo, the Greek word for Thanksgiving, and you can obviously see the connection to Eucharist. So you, the prefix there means well, good. Charis, you can see in the middle of the word, you, charis. Charis means grace, which is related to kara, which means joy. So within the word itself is like there's this, by thanksgiving, like we're giving praise to God. We're giving graces to, remember that when we talked about prayer and giving God, um, what was the word, um, I think it was giving praise to God or giving... And someone asked me after class, I forget who it was, but it's like, well, how can we do that to God who, who doesn't need it? Well, I don't know how. He, he asks us to do it. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need anything. But somehow when we give thanks, it's like giving his grace back to him somehow, multiplying it. It's sharing in it. It's, it's reciprocating it. Somehow thanksgiving really helps us to enter. And that's why it's so key. The monotony of the moment, try to give thanks. And it's, don't just say, like, general, like, oh, I give thanks for the moment. Okay. Like, no, like, pause and say, okay, what do I give thanks for? Lord, I give thanks for this exercise of trying to think of what to be thankful for. I give thanks for, and look around the room. Look at yourself. Like, these hands. I give thanks for these hands. Whatever it happens to be, but, like, actually give thanks for things. You see, that's staying in the moment and you're unwrapping the gift instead of, there's nothing here. I don't want to be here. Let me go look for something else. No, stay there and find. Seek and you shall find. Doesn't always mean go outside and seek. No, like stay right there and seek. We're surrounded by his gifts. And so that's the reference again, 1,000 gifts. So let's look at unpacking the gift so that reference to Thanksgiving, like really looking at the moment, like there are gifts hidden all around. They're invisible, or actually they can be visible. And you start to unpack it. So this Philippians 4, 9, 4, 4 through 9, is really one of my favorite phrases. And it's a very good one, I think, to kind of look at. So I'll just read it now, and I have the next slide where we can just look at words, key words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Again, I will say half rejoice. Rejo now think of who's saying this. St. Paul, who has been through a thing or two. Like, <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. I mean it. Let all men know your forbearance. Perseverance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes, passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and you can think and pausing for a moment, okay, did I miss something? Let's see. Whatever is gracious, if there's any excellence, in case I missed something, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Like, that's the antidote against Acedia, right there. So let's look, let's look like verse by verse and just elaborate a little bit more. Rejoice. It's like key words. And this is a good way to do Lexio Divina again. We mentioned that in the chapter on prayer. You yourselves can go back to this passage, and certain things are going to stick out to you, right? The word of God speaks. So here are just some key words. Rejoice. Like, that's a command. Rejoice. So 
If I just said right now, everyone, one, two, three, rejoice! I got a little laugh, that was good. I was like, oh, okay, I'll rejoice a little bit. <laughs> like, do that even by yourself. Don't be afraid to rejoice. And if you're worried about what people think, lock yourself in a room where no one's gonna see you. And if you're like, well, I never lift up my hands in prayer, it's like, you know what, I'm gonna do it. It's kind of weird. Like, I rejoice. Lord, I rejoice. I rejoice in this day. I rejoice in my gifts. I rejoice. And just keep saying it, like rejoice. Come, Holy Spirit, help me to rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is near. Sometimes we hear that phrase like, oh my gosh, the Lord is near. Why? Because he's about to like strike you down? No, the Lord is near. Look, he's here. Yeah, if someone's like trapped in sin and the Lord is near, they're like, uh-oh. But if we're really trying to, to find our way to seek him, the Lord is near, and it's a cause for rejoicing. With thanksgiving, your requests, let them be made known to God. With thanksgiving. So anytime you make a request, it's okay to make them. St. Paul says, make your request, but with thanksgiving. And the Mass is full of that. Be it, like, there's so much in the Eucharistic prayer and the different parts of the Mass, and as a priest, I say it every single day. I know it's different because I've had to be at the side of just listening, so I know it's different. Like saying the words, there's certain times, like, whoa. When I say that word every single day, and it just sticks out. Thanksgiving is all throughout. Like giving thanks to the Father. Like the whole thing is addressed to the Father in heaven. Here's a little quiz. What is the only place in the Mass, like the, the normal parts, I'm not talking about the readings, that's addressed to Jesus directly? Do you people go to Mass? No. <laughs> That's the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. We're, we're addressing the Father. Everything, the Eucharist is prayers to the Father. Then we do the Trinity. But there's one place where it's specifically, Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on the faith, sins of your, but on the faith of your church. That's the place where we're actually, like the Eucharist, he's right there on the altar and like we're talking to him. It's like, Jesus, you right here before me, right before we make the sign of peace. But this Thanksgiving, that was, my, that was just a little quiz, but Thanksgiving, let your request know made known made to God. And what better place than in Mass, the place of Thanksgiving, Eucharist. And what will happen? The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But I'm afraid I'll be alone or I'm afraid I'll be attacked. I'm afraid, well, sorry, whoops. God's peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Think of that. I think the peace of God. So it's not the anxiety of the ascidia where it's like, oh, I gotta be out of here. I gotta, no, like stay in the moment and thanks. And what is the fruit of that? God's peace. All things in their place. But not everything's in its place. If you're with God, you're in him. His peace will be your guard. He can start bringing things in you into order. Right, But it's his peace. He's in perfect order. This is a path to enter into that. The Lord is near. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts. And whatever is good, whatever is lovely, etc., think on these things. Like, don't just kind of like, oh yeah, I noticed a few things. Think on them. Like, ponder them. It's kind of like the kid that's like, where's the next present? <laughs> next one. It's like, will you slow down? <laughs> like, enjoy that. Like the spoiled kid. Like, what else did I get? I'm like, oh man, kid. You didn't get anything else. I'm taking your presents back. Like, no, like, unwrap the gift, enjoy it, look at it. It's like, oh, I love this. Play with it. Like, kids, like, immediately, like, I want to go play with my new toy. That's something about, like, the things of life. Do that. And these things practice. The God of peace will be with you. So, one other thing, look at the birds of the air. Ponder the gifts. The Oxford academic and novelist Iris Murdoch found that on one occasion when she was distracted and anxious, simply looking at a bird in her garden brought about the peace she longed for. If you're anxious, do it. Jesus said, in the whole context of worrying about tomorrow and what this, and like, look at the birds in the air. Don't just kind of, oh yeah, I think they're birds in the air. No, you're like, go oh, actually do it. And then there's like finally one poem. Does anyone know Gerard Manley Hopkins' poetry? Well, now you know one of his poems. As Kingfishers Catch Fire. So he's a priest. He was a priest. He's English. 
19th century, pretty sure 19th century. Um, so here, this is just when we read this, and not everyone gets into poetry, so like, I'm not sure I understand what he's talking about. So the general, he's looking around, he's looking around, everything I just talked about, he's looking around creation, he's looking in his garden, he's looking at whatever, and he's noticing what these things are saying. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim and roundy wells, stones ring. Like each, like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. So I'll, par- I'll, I'll comment on a second, I'll read the whole thing. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors each one dwells. Selves goes itself, myself it speaks in spells, crying what I do is me. For that I came. I say more. The just man justices, keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. So there's so much in there, but literally he's saying you have the kingfisher, the bird that you see pictured there, just this image of catching fire. Maybe he saw the light captured on the, the water as he was going down to get a fish. The dragonfly, the same thing. On its wings, maybe he saw a glimmer. The little tiny things, like photographers are great at this, especially photographers of nature. As tumbled over rim and roundy wells, stones ring. So a stone plucked into the water, just fa- watching the water. Each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Every single thing I'm not sure exactly what he's looking at here, but it's, it's saying something. Every single thing, when the wind moves it, each mortal thing does one thing. Every single thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that being indoor, each one dwells. Selves, it goes itself. Myself, it speaks and spells. Crying, what I do is me. It's like, what do you have to say? Me. Well, you're just a bird. I know. Look, the girl with the leaves. Like, those leaves are saying, look at me, I'm a leaf. Like, that's what he's talking about. He's just noticing, like, every single thing is beautiful. God looking at creation, and you look, how it is all very good. This is an invitation to do that. And I say more. The just man justices. He does just things. He goes around doing good, and I start to see that. Wow, look at those good things he's doing. He keeps grace. That keeps all his goings graces. We guard grace the more we live in that grace. And acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is. Christ. Who am I? Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places and more. Lovely in limbs. And lovely in eyes not his. Like when we say, I see Christ in you. Like, these are my eyes. Yeah, Christ is also in your eyes. To the Father through the features of men's faces. Like we are made in his image and likeness. So it's a poet unfolding that not everyone has to be a poet you don't even have to like poetry but it's just i put that as an example of you do that in your own way unwrap the gift find your own way and especially if you're an engineer and you like that kind of this do it that way whatever it is sources and then i'll ask see if we have any questions these were some three sources there are others um, out here, this first one the noonday devil acedia the unnamed evil of our times those were a series of conferences that you'll have a real systematic presentation of what I said. There's a lot more to say, right? And so he'll go through more of the history and different things. Um, A lot of what we saw in summary form. Norris, Asidia, and Me, A Marriage, Monks, and A Writer's Life is a little bit more. Both are accessible. I'd say hers is probably a little bit more accessible. And a layperson who's kind of just discovering Asidia and noticing in her own life and how it plays out in kind of her marriage, you know, in her, her layperson's life. And this is an article that in a shorter form, I think the Noonday Devil kind of covers all these topics, but this last article is very good as well. So I will end there and see if anyone has any questions. Yes. Yeah, that could be one. Or, 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 or whatever it is that's off task. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it could be. So the you know, the question was, could could one example of falling into this be now like checking the news or whatever? Especially if it comes from a place of I want to be distracted. Yeah, I think that's. It's simply put, it's that voice that says, "Hey, don't don't be where you're at. Go look for something else. It's just too boring here. It's this yeah, this kind of sense of I gotta I gotta go somewhere else. I gotta do something else. I gotta be somewhere else. I gotta. I'm not rooted in the moment. Yeah." So that would be a good example. When my, cl- my talk on the 29th of September, the feast day, I had a few slides in there that t- touched on this as well. And I had some, it talked about similar things too, about Thanksgiving, finding God hidden, the glory of God hidden in the normal things. Because what we're, I had a picture of Twitter, like people kind of like this ivy of Twitter, like just always like, what's happening? What's happening? I wonder what's this person thinking about me and I'm likes and dislikes and this and that. Yeah, it's this, it creates this agitated state I can't just be happy and who I am. It doesn't mean you don't have to have Twitter, but just look at it less. <laughs> right, well, thank you for your attention, and we will close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for all of your gifts. Thank you for the gift of each moment and all the gifts hidden throughout our lives. Help us to have eyes to discover them and to see how you're present in them, to show us your love and to sustain us on the journey. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.